Deep River Podcast, Episode 15. Whether or not their the American people would never vote for socialism. He said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adapt every fragment of the socialist program. Podcast is an up-to-date survival podcast based on military, wilderness, and modern-day survival and may be found at thepreferpodcast.com. I am Ken Jensen, and I am the host, and this is the podcast about everything survival. This is episode 15, and today I discuss collecting and conserving water with a focus in collecting it from rain. Today's show notes may be found at thepreferpodcast.com forward slash 015. Now for the housekeeping. Uh, I just wanted to remind you guys to head over to my social media pages. Uh, that would be Facebook, Twitter, Zello, YouTube. Uh, if you can think of it, Google+. Plus. Uh, I've even got a LinkedIn account, although I don't spend much time there. However, if you do leave me something on LinkedIn, I will get it in my email, so then I can check it. I have... Uh, all that stuff going straight to my email, at least for now, until I get uh, bombarded with people um, commenting and stuff. Then I'll just have to take that off of my email notifications and then just show up a couple times a day. But for now, it's all my email notifications, so you can go ahead and uh, just leave me a comment on any of them and I'll get them. How do you find me on social media? How do you find me on Facebook and on Twitter? You can go to theprepperpodcast.com slash... That would be a forward slash, not a backslash, theprepperpodcast.com forward slash, and then the name of the social media site. So an example of that would be theprepperpodcast.com forward slash Facebook. Okay, so remember that. Also, go over to iTunes. I really would like you to go to iTunes, and guess what? You can go there at theprepperpodcast.com forward slash iTunes and leave me your comments. I get your, I get notifications of your comments. I check iTunes for comments, and I will always comment back to you. While we're talking about comments, I would really like for you to go ahead and comment on today's show notes because the Google machine really loves it when uh, blogs and stuff like that have comments. So go ahead and leave me some comments on my show notes. I would appreciate that a lot. Uh, You can call me again at the Prepper Podcast call-in line, and that is is 978-knows-it. He knows it. 978-knows-it. Or if you don't have letters on your touchpad, or if you're one of those guys using the rotary phone, then that would be 978-566-9748. All right. Um, Next week is actually going to be a special episode. So make sure you tune in. I will be getting interviewed by someone in this community, in the survival community, He is going to be interviewing me, and he's a fairly big name in the survival world. So uh, just tune in next week because I recorded it on my end as well. There will be a couple uh, skips and stuff in there, but um, you know, we when you do when you do interviews, a lot of times the interviews are done over Skype. Well, you do an interview over Skype, (laughs) sometimes. Skype is going to start breaking up on you a little bit, and sometimes it's going to drop out on you. It's usually a pretty good thing to use. Well, this time, it dropped out on us like three different times, and uh, it was cutting out and stuff like that. But you can hear me perfectly fine. Uh, He is interviewing me, okay? Um, If he sends me his recording, then I will kind of, um, I will do some post-production and get that in there instead of the one that I have recorded off of Skype. But for now, what you're going to get is me, clear as a bell, and him, not quite as clear, but I think you can still, 
you, you can understand everything that he's saying. It's just, you know, it's it kind of bothered me a little bit whenever we were doing the interview. I can't really help that. He can't really help that. It turned out as a pretty darn good interview anyways, and that interview was on emergency triage on the start method. So go ahead and uh, tune in next week. That would be a really awesome one for you guys to uh, to listen to. Now that I've talked about that, we uh, are going to go to a listener call. This is Michael from Mississippi. Michael has actually uh, wrote in to me a couple different times, and um, he, um, sorry guys, I almost had to sneeze there. I had to, I had to kind of pause for a second there. Okay, so Michael from Mississippi has actually written in a couple times about prepping and and you know doing it with your kids and stuff like that. And I think I've given him an answer on my blog. Um, now he's called in, so I just wanted to play his call. Okay. Hey, Ken. My name's Michael uh, from Mississippi. I actually sent you an email, and you responded to me about the, you know, prepping with kids and everything. Um, really not – don't have a question or anything like that. just wanted to call in and say, dude, you're you're doing a good job. Um, listen to you on my way back and forth to work. I um, got a promotion, so I'm doing a long commute right now until we can get everything moved into the new house. But I uh, appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up. Don't stop. Later, brother. Thanks, Michael from Mississippi. I appreciate you calling in to the um, listener line. Uh, that is 978-KNOWS-IT. I believe that's it. It's a pretty new number, so hopefully I didn't get that wrong. I really do appreciate it. I, I appreciate every single person that listens to this podcast, which is about a 1,000 people right now. I really want it to grow, so why don't you push that out to everybody that you know and and uh, at least have them listen to one of them. That Michael is actually my very first call in on my listener line. So the rest of you guys go ahead and call in. And uh, if you are, um, you know what, if you're nice or if you are not nice, there's a very good chance that I will play you. All right. Um, I want to play everybody. I'm going to play your opinions on here. And uh, if you tell me to pack sand, then, you know, I might play you anyways because. You know, everybody's got their opinion. So, once again, thank you, Michael. Let's move on to the next part of the show. The discussion today, I've already told you, is going to be collecting rainwater and conserving gray water. Okay, so I usually tell people whenever they're first starting off to start collecting water in soda bottles because they are great and they're extremely cheap. They stack well, they're durable. I mean, they can keep a cold, you know, they can keep a freezer cold. So you take those two liter bottles and you fill them about three quarters of the way with water, throw them in the bottom of your freezer, and when your power goes out, you've got a big frozen mass there keeping the freezer cold. And they're really good to just pull out of the freezer and throw in a cooler so you don't have to buy big bags of ice and stuff like that. Once they thaw, you know, because your power went out, so once they thaw, now you have drinking water. So, so far they're really, really useful, aren't they? We begin uh, working on the bottles as our beginning point, but we're going to do other stuff as well. Um, I just want, if you're not going to do anything else, I want you to do these soda bottles. However, I would, I would recommend doing other things, and that's the stuff we're going to talk about today. So in small disasters, you know, um, let's just say a 12-hour blackout, then your need is not very high. Now, as the disaster goes larger and the time factor goes up in a disaster, so does your need for food and water. So does your need for water storage. Jugs are just not going to last too long. So after you start with the bottles, I want you to work on some other stuff. One of the other things that I want you to work on is rain barrels. Rain barrels are pretty awesome. They're 50 bucks at Lowe's. I found one on Amazon for about $69. And uh, it's got a hose connection on the bottom of it so that you can use the water out of it. It's got an overflow on the top of it and everything. Pretty much, you just throw that thing on your downspout and it's good. Place it under your downspout. Put screen on, you know, it, this is, um, if you uh, are making one, you put the screen on top of it for some mosquitoes. You don't want mosquito larvae in there. That's nasty. And then uh, you can, you do get chemicals if you have a shingled roof. So if you have a shingled roof, 
you're going to want a uh, first flow catch diverter flush system. Uh, let me let me rephrase that to make it sound uh, more like something instead of a bunch of words thrown together. There's a first catch diverter system, all right, that'll flush out all the chemicals, and then once um, it's you know it's flushed out enough over some time, it's gonna rock back over and it's gonna allow the rest of the water to go straight in. So you want that no matter what, but if you have shingles on your roof, you definitely want that because you don't want to put that in your rain barrel. You'll put a filter on top of the barrel. You can, or you can, you know, or you can use it without a filter. You take that and you just use it for your garden. You don't really need a, a high quality filter or anything like that if you're just going to use it for your garden. And another thing is if you don't want to have a filter on it, you can buy what's called a Berkey. And that's a kitchen countertop filter. They're, they usually hold about two to three, sometimes four gallons. And they'll usually do about one gallon per minute um, more than what their capacity is. So if it's a three gallon tank then it'll do somewhere like four gallons a minute or something like that um you know I, i've got show notes so go over to my show notes at theprepperpodcast.com slash zero one five i believe it's zero one five let me double check that again yep it's zero one five so you can go over to my show notes you can click the link there i got one for the berkey i've got one for the um for the rain barrel um and i've got other i've got other links there as well um they are great for gardening because what what happens is the rainwater as it comes down it's going to grab nitrogen and other things out of the air uh this is a normal system right nature knows what the heck it's doing and you know it wasn't just thrown together um to not work i mean nature was working long before people were ever around so Nature works. Let's use nature. The rain barrels are really great because the water is going to run down or it's going to fall down. It's going to catch all the nitrogen. Now that is in the water. Okay. That water then is going to be put on your plants and your plants love all that nitrogen. I promise you, you can water day after day after day after day while you are gardening and then a good rain comes and you'll see your plants flourish flourish your plants are just growing they're holding on they're doing whatever but once that rain comes is when you see the most growth and it's not that water it's all the stuff that's in that water that makes it work well and it is the lack of stuff from your darn city water okay uh let's go over to the next thing real quick I'm going to explain to you a little bit how to make an extremely simple rain barrel. There's no filter on it. There's just a screen to keep the mosquitoes out. There's no first flow on it. It just goes straight out of your downspout into your rain barrel. Okay, don't drink this water without treating it or without purifying it somehow uh, just because of your roof chemicals and stuff like that. Now, if you have a tin roof, you do whatever you want. I'm not taking, um, you know, I don't think it would hurt you and if i was in a bad situation and needed water i would drink it but i gotta cover my butt here guys so filter it if you can all right uh the steps is you're going to use a barrel a trash can or a rubbermaid tub you're going to cut a hole in the lid you're going to place a screen over that hole and you might be holding that screen that that's the type like a window screen something like that and you hold that onto the trash can or barrel or whatever with a bungee cord. That's really all you need. You're going to install a spigot on the side on the bottom, and you're going to elevate the barrel up. Let's elevate the barrel about, um, I don't know, five, six feet, okay? Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to put the spigot on the side, and then there's going to be a sink right under that spigot. So now you actually have a utility sink, right? You have a barrel full of rainwater, and you can wash your hands with it. You have a spigot that you can use the water from, so you can connect a hose and bring it to wherever you want. But if you needed to wash your hands, you've already got a sink there. Well, at the bottom of the sink, 
it doesn't flow onto the ground. It doesn't go into sewage. What does it go into? It goes into another bucket or another drum. It's going to be a five-gallon bucket. Now, if you can elevate the first drum high enough, you could actually throw a 50-gallon drum below it. And what this is, is this is called gray water. It is not bad water. It just has uh, soaps and alkalines in it. So it's really good for plants. That's the reason why people started reclaiming gray water is because it's good for plants in, uh, you know, in some moderation. So you take that gray water and then you can use it on your plants. And your plants will treat it and it'll soak into the ground and it won't be that bad. Um, it, it's, it's a really good use of your water. The plants love it. All right. So, uh, where was I, where was I? You close, um, close to the top of the initial barrel. Let's go ahead and throw a uh, PVC overflow on it. Uh, all you're going to do is, you know, drill a hole into it, put some PVC pipe on the top of it. And if the rain has too much or, or you have too much rain, and it overflows, at least some of it is going to overflow into the sink with this PVC overflow drain, and then now it goes into your gray water bucket, so you're still reclaiming that extra water. You can put as many of these buckets side by side as you want. You can tie them together, and uh, you know you could use a 50-gallon drum. You can use a 250-gallon IBC tote, okay? 250 gallons, those are those big square uh, plastic totes that have the uh, metal cage around them and they're stackable so you could make a lot of these there is um they they hold five times more and they take up very little footprint so you could just put these on the ground and you can stack them up do whatever and you can hold a lot of water water with these things i know of people that have dug holes into the ground and placed these ibc totes into the ground to make like a cistern uh, i'm not gonna do the cistern i don't want a cistern and um then i gotta pump the water to get it back out or at least I like, use a ladle or a hand pump or something like that. Why don't I just elevate it a little bit so it can give me pressure? So um, let's let's think about how quickly we're going to fill these things because because a lot of people don't really comprehend how quickly these things will fill up in a small rain. So I've um, in my show notes I've shown you a rooftop calculation. All right. If you have a 1,200 square foot home and only half of it empties into a 50 gallon drum, you know, because we don't typically have uh, homes with our entire roof slanted to one direction. So let's say half of a 1,200 square foot home, that's 600 square feet. And I'm not taking into account pitch and stuff like that uh, for a little more surface area. I'm just saying it's 600 square feet. And uh, to fill up a 50 gallon drum, it is only going to take. 0.13 inches of rain to fill it up that's not even a hard rain that's like a sprinkle all right so you're going to fill this thing up quick and with a 250 gallon tote it would take like 0.65 inches of rain so a little more than a half an inch of rain will fill up one of these 250 gallon ibc totes that's pretty cool um, now I, like I said, I put this, uh, equation in the show notes so you guys could grab my conversion factors and stuff off of it and you could do all that stuff yourself. All right. So now that we know how quickly these things can fill up, let's think about the pressure. Now, reason why I said elevate it is because when you elevate it, it's going to give you pressure. The typical pressure at your tap at home, like your sink is going to be somewhere around 50 pounds per square inch, 50 PSI. Uh, that, that's your typical pressure. Now, each foot of elevation on this drum, and we're talking about the top. We're not talking about the bottom, okay? Um, we're going to say the top water level in reference to where your spigot is, is going to give you, or, or not your spigot, the end of your hose. So let's say your hose is attached to a spigot. This thing is up in the air and your hose is on the ground. Okay. So we're going to talk in relative to the ground. So one foot higher, each foot is 0.43 PSI. So with 10 
feet of elevation, and that's the top of it, not the bottom, you can meet um, you can meet the same as city water. But just five feet up, you can get nearly 20 psi, which is going to be plenty. That is definitely plenty of water. Um, but you're not going to be using a hose on the ground. So, you know, you elevate this thing, you know, five feet off the ground, then you're going to end up with 10 foot of elevation. And then you're going to use the water probably about four to five feet high. And that will give you about seven feet of elevation, which will give you plenty of pressure. Now, there's another thing that you can do with these uh, drums or these totes, and it's called a pressurized cistern. If you don't want to go through the trouble of trying to collect rainwater, which I don't know why you wouldn't, because it seems like this is a much easier method than the pressurized cistern, but it does give you pressure. And the cistern can sit anywhere, and it's going to have pressure on it. Let me explain to you what this pressurized cistern is. It uses city water to pressurize it. All right, so <laughs> you're the... Um, the utility line, the utility pipe coming in to your home that you that provides you with pressure, instead of going around the home, is going to go into this cistern. It's going to go into this tote, and it's going to be uh, sealed tight uh, in this tote. And that will pressurize the tote. And then you will pull from the bottom of the tote. <laughs> okay? So you're pulling from the bottom of the tote. You're filling it up from the top with city water, and the city pressure is now in your tote because it is 100% sealed. And then the bottom of the tote is going out to all the services in your house. Why would you do this? Well, you would do this because when you lose this, this will keep you a constant fresh supply of water available at all times. And if you lose, if you lose, um, if you lose water pressure, or if you uh, have issues with, um, you know, they have bacteria like contamination in the in the water supply. Well, now you shut that off, and you've still got 250 gallons of water available to you and your family. And if you have more of these totes, you could do 500, 750, 1,000, 1,250, on and on and on and on. I mean, there's a lot of capacity there. Um, just remember <laughs> that this water is heavy, okay? It's 8.33 pounds per gallon. That's 8 pounds per gallon. So 50 gallons is going to be like 416 pounds. All right, that's two men, um, which your attic will probably be able to handle 50 gallons if you wanted to put it in the attic. Here's another cool thing. The pressure that you're going to feel at the tote is less than what you're going to feel at your um, faucet in your home because if you have this cistern in your attic which like I said you can put it anywhere but if you put it in your attic then that's going to allow you to get even more pressure from it now be careful with that because your the pipes in your home can only handle so much so let's talk about it being in your attic though um, that's that's 416 pounds you're not going to pick this thing up and just move it and if you have one of the 250 gallon totes, that is 2,082 pounds. 2,082 pounds. That's ridiculous. That's really heavy. And you are definitely not moving this. And if your home can't handle it, well, then you just lost. Um, you know, you just flooded your home because this thing falls, you know, it could bust open or whatever. So. I wouldn't recommend having this stuff up in your attic, but the, there are people that have done this, okay? They've had four of these totes upstairs in their attic, but their home was built to withstand all this. Now, what if you spring a leak? You know, if you spring a leak in one of these totes, well, then you better be able to um, do something about it because you're going to end up damaging a lot of stuff. Like I said, I don't think that having stuff in your attic is a very good idea. Even if you're collecting rainwater and you divert it over to your attic, I don't think it's a great idea. So let's just not do it. Put the tote outside where it's not going to flood your house. Okay, like I said, you can put it in the ground as well, but you're not going to get much pressure. If it is attached to city water, you'll have pressure up until city pressure goes away. Then you're not going to have pressure and you'll have to hand pump it out 
something like that. Okay, so not much, not much will compare to a good well that doesn't dry up. That's important for you to understand. So people that have wells, I mean, there's not much that can compare to that. That's almost an infinite supply of water. Always have a backup hand pump for the wells, though. You know, because if your power goes out, you want to be able to get water. Go ahead and have a hand pump. You can pump water just about anywhere. And those hand pumps, I got a link to one, again, in the show notes. You can get a hand pump that will go side by side with your well pump. You don't have to do anything else. It'll extend all the way down into a shallow or deep well. You can pump the water out and, you know, you've still got water even if you lose power and water. Uh, because if you have a well, you know, you have to you have to have uh, power to your pump. Although there are well pumps that will run off of solar or if you're like me and you have battery banks and generators and stuff, you can still run your well pump. But this hand pump is a backup in case all else fails. We back up our backup for the backup. Okay, guys? So you can keep water in your land. All right, this this is a different thing. All right, let's say you got a well or you got a pond. You can keep water in your land by using swales and ponds, um, and then it'll soak it into the ground. If you use this and then you mulch your yard really, really well, then you're going to retain a lot of water in the ground for your plants to flourish. So if you end up in a drought or something like that, you don't have to worry about water and anything. So what if you're in a survival situation, your water is gone, right? Your power is gone, and you are in the middle of a drought. Well, then your plants will be fine if you are using permaculture swells and ponds to keep the water on the land. Uh, and a good mulch cover to keep it from evaporating off the ground. Um, some places don't really need this, but have this stuff in your repertoire so that you don't end up uh, hurting when everybody else is hurting. That's why we're survivalists. Don't forget natural sources of water. We're talking rivers, lakes, streams, underground springs. Uh, these usually do have minimal bacteria in them, uh, we do, you know, I, as a military, or, or sorry, as a wilderness survival type person, I recommend people always keep things to purify water. Always purify the water before you drink it because, you know, when you're in a survival situation, diarrhea and dysentery are going to be main killers. They're main killers in third world countries. And what do you think it's going to be like if you're stuck in a survival situation? So always clean the water from the rivers, lakes, streams, uh, underground springs, those are almost usually clean. So you don't have to worry about stuff dying in them and crapping in them. So those are usually pretty darn good. All right, uh, there's usually uh, no bacteria in those. But you can also pull from, you know, from like dirty ponds and stuff like that. I mean, if you're really struggling and you can clean it out through your t-shirt and then use some um, tablets and stuff to clean your water out, or use a live filter, okay? Um, so use pur purification uh, tablets. I carry a set of them in my bug out bag. I've got a link in the show notes again to show you the set that I have in my bug out bag. I haven't had to use them yet, but they are there in case I need them. All right, so now we're going to talk about gray water systems real quick. Uh, hopefully, I can get done with this stuff uh, kind of fast because I'm really hungry and my wife is almost done cooking. Gray water is used, uh, or gray water is water that's been used uh, at your home that isn't used for waste management. Um, what I mean is no pee, no urine, no crap. Okay, so no toilet water. This is sinks, bathtubs, and washing machines. Like I said, it's just going to be some soapy water, usually. You can reclaim the gray water, and, and I'll explain to you why. Why would you want to reclaim gray water? Well, let's look at the typical home use. 26% is used for flushing toilets, 23% for the laundry room, 20% for showers and baths, 15% for faucets in your kitchen and bathroom, 13% use... Uh, you know, lost due to leaks and drips in all of your uh, in all of your faucets, and three percent for the dishwasher. So 
these are our lead contributors to uh, the uh, water that we are using up. So if we could get rid of the laundry water and get rid of the shower and bath water and get rid of the faucet water, then we're going to get rid of a lot of our use. Shoot, just the shower and bathroom faucet by themselves is going to cut your water by like 25%. Why would you not do this? This water could be used for flushing toilets. Okay, you don't need the cleanest water in the world to flush your crap down the toilet. It makes great irrigation because of the alkaline pH. And like I said, all these alkalis in the water, it's going to have an alkaline pH, which is above 7. Quick systems, you, you, I've got a quick system, that, an idea for quick system. You go ahead and have a tank under your bathroom sink, maybe like a five-gallon bucket or something like that, and then a little, um, a little switch and pump that is going to pump that water into the back of your toilet. Now, you'll want to cut that flow off if your toilet fills up. So um, you could just pull it out and pour it into your toilet. That, that would work, too but um, I don't think it's going to make up enough. When you're doing a bath or something, you could go ahead and uh, leave the water in when you're done and pour that into the back of your toilet, into your tank, your toilet tank, okay? Well, more detailed. So let's think about uh, a much more detailed scenario of people who are collecting and using all kinds of water, okay? You collect rainwater. You use that water for bathing and washing. Now, the water that you're going to use for the toilet, well, guess what? You're kind of screwed. That, that goes, that's black water now. You're not going to reclaim that. But the bathing and washing, go ahead. You have two options. You can throw it in the toilet, or you can put that in a botanical cell in your house for interior plants, which is really cool because it's going to come in on one side of the botanical cell. All the plants are going to use it, and then it's going to flow out of the other side. And believe it or not, it's going to be extremely clean water. You could probably drink this water. I would still want to use the drain water for toilet water. The only reason why we're using the botanical cells is so that the water is somewhat clean before we put it into the toilet tank. And because it is free water for watering our plants. And they are going to love the alkalinity of it. Then the drain water is used and it is sent outside to either a septic tank or more botanical cells. You'll put it in a um, kind of like a little uh, marshy area that is going to have a lot of plants in it that you're not really going to eat or touch or use. Uh, these plants are going to clean it and then further down you're going to have all of the edible plants and stuff like that. So the water is pretty much clean before it ever gets to these other plants. Um, in wilderness, uh, if you dig a hole about two feet away from the edge of a river, it's considered clean water because the dirt cleans it and the plants clean it so well. They clean it so well that you can, you can drink this stuff from a couple feet away. You dig a hole and the water comes in. It's nasty and dirty, so, you know, why would you not go ahead and filter it with your t-shirt or something? And I would still recommend always boiling your water if you have the possibility to. If you don't have the ability to clean your water, then, you know, you just drink what you got. So, I've told you how to collect water. I've told you how to conserve water and reclaim water. So now here is the boring safety blurb. Do not contact or consume gray water. Do not, definitely don't contact or consume black water. I really believe in that. Contacting the gray water, that, that's crap. I just say it. <laughs> oh, how do, I, how do I do this? Man, I'm going to get myself in trouble with this thing. Do not contact or consume gray water. Let's just leave it at that. All right, the microorganisms that treat the gray water uh, are very detrimental when breathed in, so don't atomize the water 
or use a sprinkler system with it. If you wash cloth diapers or your water is generated by uh, sick people, infectious people, divert it to septic or sewage because that is now black water. It does not belong in your gray water system. If the system is designed for you, it is for you, not a party of 30 or even three. Divert to sewage or septic so you don't overload your system. It is not designed for all these extra guests. So you need to have a backup to just, just divert that crap, okay? Literally, divert that stuff and you won't, you know, you won't overload your system because trust me, you don't want to do that. After 24 hours, the water should be considered black water. So gray water, stagnant for 24 hours, is black water. Get rid of it. If you don't want it in your septic or on your plants or in your soil, don't use household cleaners. Okay? Uh, you can make your own household cleaners. We make our own. But there are many organic or even edible cleaners that work very well now to clean things, get rid of bacteria, and it's not going to hurt your system. But if you don't want it in your systems, if you don't want it in your ground or anything, don't use household, don't use specific household cleaners. Always discharge your water into a mulch filled basin so you do not contaminate the surface water. You do not want this water rolling down the down grade uh, per, uh, perpendicular or across from contour down into your edible garden so you discharge into something that's filled with mulch so it has to stay there and it has to be purified i do have um, links on almost all of my podcast notes i try to do links to blog posts that i've done because i am a blogger as well i am a new podcaster but i have been blogging for quite some time so I have, I believe, three different related posts to this that I have uh, given you at the bottom of my show notes. So go ahead and check those show notes out. Once again, uh, let's conserve water. Let's collect water. And I also want to thank Michael from Mississippi for calling in. All of you guys also call in. That's 978 knows it. And while you're doing that, go ahead and jump on iTunes, thepreferpodcast.com forward slash iTunes. That is thepreferpodcast.com forward slash iTunes. Uh, And go ahead and leave me a comment there. All right, guys. I hope you had fun. And I had a lot of fun with this one. I guess uh, collecting water could be kind of dry, but I hope I held your attention. And, um, you know, I believe this is uh, an important topic, especially when it comes to survival. Everybody wants the gun. They want the AR-15 and they want, you know, fire and stuff like that. But, you know, you don't last very long without water. So it's very important for us to talk about water. So I've had a really good time. I hope you guys have had a really good time. And I will see you next week a little bit. I will probably do an introduction to the, um, the interview that I will be in. And I will let you guys listen to my interview. All right. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Goodbye.